Thessalonians chapter number 5. And we're going, to, we're going to begin here in just a moment studying verses 25 through 28. But I want you to stand with me for just one moment. And let's have prayer before we make our way through these final verses of 1 Thessalonians. But let's pray together, okay? Father, we're not reading some book that was dug up by some man. We're not reading a book that was put together by some kind of committee. We're not reading a book that was placed here just to sit on our shelves or be carried in our hands once a week or twice a week. God, we're about to read your inspired and infallible word. And Father, I pray that we would reference it as such. I pray our response to it would be as you speaking. And I pray, God, that those of us who believe and have trusted your Son as our Savior, Lord, and have life, eternal spiritual life in us, would respond to this truth. And nothing would keep us from responding. No power of hell, nothing of this world would keep us from responding to your truth, God, for your glory. Father, that, that one that's here today that doesn't know you're not even, that's not for sure that they know you're not. Father, let them trust your son as their savior this day, that they might have life, that they might know your truth. Because we know no natural man, no lost man can understand the spiritual truths of this book. We pray that they would have life so they can understand a living book. Help us to do that now for your glory. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You be seated. Seven months ago, Seven months ago, we began looking at the book of 1 Thessalonians together. And this morning, we are going to conclude our study of this book. We are, we're going to include our study of this book by looking at what somebody called this. Here's what somebody said about these last few verses that we're reading, these last four verses that we're studying. They said that, this person said, all dedicated pastors desire what we're going to be studying from their own churches. What we're going to be looking at this morning, all pastors desire from their churches that they pastor. We're going to be looking at uh, prayer once again. We're going to be looking at love for one another once again. And we're going to be looking at responding to the word of God once again. And here's just a, a th something I want you to keep in mind as we go down through here. The majority of things that we're going to see in verses 24, 25, 26, 27, and 28, they cannot be done apart from a local meeting of a New Testament church. I have been on this and talking about this several times because of the fearful direction I see church going because of the pandemic and some other things in our world. People are getting away from the meaning of the church. But there's so much scripture that cannot be obeyed without a local meeting of a New Testament church. Amen. And we're going to see some of those things this morning. May God solidify well into our minds this morning that the local New Testament church is God's plan, not religion's plan. Religion has destroyed it. But it's God's plan. This meeting right here, pastor-led church, deacon-served church, people responding, that's the will of God. Meeting just like we're meeting. We do some other things, but this is what you find in Scripture. Amen. And maybe we would defend it with all our soul. Maybe we would respond to it with all our souls to keep it what it ought to be for God's glory. Let's see these things as we walk through the Scriptures. But let's notice what are one of the things that all dedicated pastors desire to see in their churches. Listen to what Paul says. Paul wanted the Thessalonians to pray for his ministry team. Look at verse 25. If you've got a Bible with you, you'll be able to easily follow along with what we're looking at. In verse 25, he says, brethren, do you know how many times we saw that word in 1 Thessalonians? I didn't go through and read and count, but someone said that 17 times we have saw 
the word brethren in this, in this book. 17 times. Three times in these closing four verses we're going to see the, that word brethren. Why would he do that? Do you know why Paul wanted, would say that so many times? He wanted, as somebody said, he wanted to underscore his strong affection for the Thessalonians. Do you know what's missing in the church? Strong affection right. for one another. Mm -hmm. When people are in hurting and in need in our church family, it should hurt us. When, when, our, when somebody in our church family is prospering in whatever way, spiritually, whatever, in other ways, we ought to be glad for them. But there is a, a, a self-centered thing about this world. We take selfies. If you mention just about anything to anybody, they will spin that to them. This world is about them. Their world is. But I want to tell you this. You and I get ourselves right. And we minister to others. That's the plan of God for his church. The first one will not. The second one will not happen. Unless the first one happens. But Paul. He had such an affection for these people. Brethren. He calls them. Time and time. The word brethren left no one out and served as a basis for Paul's first request because they were together in the family of God and he had the right to expect them to pray for him. Some of you have brothers or sisters and you can call on them and I'm talking about blood relatives. You can call on them and you can call on no one else. This is the same with the church. You ought to be able to call on your brethren your brothers and sisters in Christ when all the world is forsaking you. Amen. There is just a fellowship with the church. And Paul is calling upon his church, his fellow brothers and sisters. He says, verse 25, brethren, pray. What is prayer? When we studied chapter 5, verse 17, which says pray without ceasing, we said this is what prayer is. It's simple, but it's true. But this is what prayer is. Prayer is to simply to speak to God. When I, when I, whether I do it in my study, whether I do it here with you, or if I'm just here at the church praying around through this building, I'm speaking to God. I'm speaking, and I must keep that in front of me, that I'm speaking to all the way all-powerful, merciful, gracious God that is able to intervene. That is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think. But sometimes I let what I see in the church and in people's lives deter me from that type of praying. But Paul is asking that the brethren pray. I want you to notice this. When we don't see this We don't see this maybe as clearly as we would have in the language that this was originally written, but this word pray is in what they call present tense, but it doesn't mean present like we would think of it. It really doesn't have any kind of time element to it. it somewhat it does, but it mainly means this, to keep doing it. Paul is not asking this church to pray for him once and quit. He is asking them, when he says this in verse 25, brethren, pray for us. You could put in a bracket there. Of course, it wouldn't be inspired, but it would help us to understand because this word pray is in the, is in the present tense. He is telling them to continually pray for him and his ministry team. That's what he's asking. I would ask the same. I'm not a ministry team you know, I was asked by a pastor friend of mine who uh, pastors quite a large church, about a thousand or so. He says, so what are your staff meetings like? I said, well, we all get along most of the time. <laughs> I said, it's just me. <laughs> but we get along most of the time. 
If you heard me in my study, you'd probably think there was two or three of us down there. I'm asking an answer question. I'm, there, there might be something wrong with me. But I'll tell you what, pray. Pray. I think pastors are so discouraged. And I think it started before COVID. I talked to many who says, I'm just over it. And I'll tell you this. When we get right with the word of God, those things will not be the issue. When the church says we're going to take what the word of God says seriously, we're going to respond, you'll see those things start to fade away. But they are discouraged. And I don't know if that's what Paul was asking about here. I'll talk about that in just for just a moment. I don't know what he was asking for. He doesn't say specifically. Well, getting ahead of myself, but he doesn't say specifically. What he's wanting them to pray for. But notice what he says. He says, brethren, pray for us. He's talking about praying for his ministry team. But I, just as I said, I, I notice he didn't say pray for us concerning this or pray for us concerning that. He is just simply saying pray for us. Here's a man in dangerous times trying to give a message to a people who would rather kill him or beat him or see him die to allow people to hear it? What would, we, what would you say to a pastor today if he was saying, pray for us, what would you think he was asking for? Here's what I would think when a preacher tells me that. He's discouraged. But I'll tell you what would encourage you a response to the truth. For somebody to come and say, I shared the gospel this week. Even if they didn't believe, you say, I shared the gospel this week. Amen. Look, at what, look at what he says. Pray for us. There was a minister years and years ago offered this, uh, somebody called it a solicitation for prayer. This pastor did from his pulpit to his congregation and somebody recorded that. And here's what that prayer said. I want to read it to you. He says, brethren, this pastor said, brethren, pray for us that we may, that we may be kept from sin, that we, would, we may walk carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. Of course, he's talking about Ephesians 5, 16. That our hearts may be more devoted to God and our lives impressive examples of the gospel we preach. Do you love that line? I want to read that line again. He says, in our lives, impressive examples of the gospel we preach. That we may be more completely furnished for our work and our, and our conflicts and put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6, he's talking about. That we may be more faithful and wise to win souls, that we may discipline our body and bring it into subjection, lest we preach to others and we ourselves be a castaway. I know of a pastor who did something he knew would get him tossed out of the ministry. You know why he did it? He didn't want to be in the ministry no more. He didn't know other, no other escape. He saw it. I'll tell you, pray for us, Paul says. Pray for us, he says. Pray for us, I say. Look at the second thing, verse 26. Paul, wanted the, wanting, Paul is wanting the Thessalonians to love each other. Paul is wanting the Thessalonians to love each other. He says, great. When it comes time for the church meeting, what do we do? We're in an odd time right now. That doesn't mean we can't greet our brothers and sisters in Christ. But that's what Paul is asking them to do. He's greet. He's going to say all the brethren. He's talking about greeting the brethren. He's talking about a time of fellowship. It is, it is not a time to walk in and take your seat and be alone in a room full of people. People say, I'm lonely. And they sit in a crowd of people. 
but you have to shoot them with a shotgun to stop them after the church's service is over. <laughs> There's so in a hurry to get home to be alone again. And I'll tell you, Satan loves it. He'll work in that mind. He'll allow you to sit right in this room and be all by yourself. But I'm telling you, you are not all by yourself. You're, you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. You're a brother or a sister in Christ. You are not alone. You are my brother or sister. But he, he says, greet them. Somebody will see a pastor. I, I've had people say this to me. You go around, and some of them are joking. And I, I don't care for people who joke. I like to joke. Uh, I'll tell this on Amanda yesterday. <laughs> We, I, she was singing at the piano and I had pulled up in my truck and was going to unlock the door and go, I could hear her singing, I knew she couldn't hear me and I unlocked the door and she's in that room playing and singing and I screamed into that hallway and she was in a roller chair that roll, it rolled away <laughs> oh it was pretty funny <laughs> She didn't care for it. She didn't care for it. Boy, I sure did. Your time is good. It always does. But people say, Preacher, you're going around shaking hands, you politicking. Let me tell you what. I'm not trying to keep a pastor's job. I'm, to part I'm trying to partake in what God has, the privilege God has given to every believer. To come into this building, this meeting and fellowship with their brothers and sisters in Christ. Keeping a pastoral job is the least of my concerns in any facet of it. We're not politicking, we're participating in a great blessing. And if you're coming in here and just going to your seat and sitting down, you're cheating yourself out of a great blessing. If, the, if your church family couldn't pick, pick, pick you out in the lineup, you need to talk to them. If they don't know you in Walmart, now, I understand you got the mask on. <laughs> I've been telling everybody, there's one thing I have taken as to be sold during this time of COVID, and I may have said this here before, I will say it again. I used to watch those superhero movies. We still watch them. And we'd say, there's no way they don't know who that is. Batman, you know, he's got his face mask on, he's got his eyes painted. I, I believe they don't know really who he is. Because <laughs> people walk by me in Walmart, I don't know who they are. And I've known them for years. If they don't know you in Walmart, get in church and fellowship while you're in that church. So they'll know you, so they can pray for you, so you can go to them. But listen, anyways, listen to what he said. Brethren, greet all the brethren, verse 26. How do you greet them, does he say? With a holy kiss. Now, I want you smooching on me, I'll play. <laughs> I got two ladies I let smooch on me. You say two, yes. Amanda and Millie, which is our dog. <laughs> What does he mean by this? Let's think about it. You think about Paul's day. And I, I do think we have a, a custom here. I do think we have some American customs that would be very similar parallel to it. But in Paul's day, it was customary for people to greet a superior, listen to this, with a kiss on the foot, knee or elbow. Or the hand. That was Paul's day. But friends kiss one another on the cheek. I, I want you to notice what kind of kiss this was, though, before we go any farther. What's it say it was? Holy. A holy kiss. There's absolutely no sensuality in this. Uh, should we practice this is the question. Here's what one Bible student said. And he said, while defining its spirit... There is no indication that these words were intended to inaugurate a new Christian practice. 
The kiss on the cheek was a common form of Oriental greeting among friends. It's something they already did in that time. The custom, common in non-Christian circles, was taken over by the Christian church, but purified and sanctified at the Holy Ghost. It was exchanged among believers as they assembled for worship. Apparently at this time, the sexes were segregated in the assembly, and the men kissed the men and the women the women, because that would be extremely inappropriate the other way. Another student of scripture says, in Western culture, the closest approximation of the holy kiss would be the handshake. In many church worship, service, worship times, there is a time of fellowship in which the brothers and sisters will shake hands with those around them. This is a custom that is similar to that in the Oriental nations. Because we take it and sanctify it. It doesn't, it means something. When you shake a hand with your brother or sister, it means something. When you give them a hug, it means something. Not like this world who sticks something in your back while they have you hugged. Or trying to sell you something. Or because you love them, you shake their hand. Because you love them, you hug them. You just love them. But I, I want to point out one more thing before we move on, though, to verse 27. Um, this holy kiss, it can't take place without the meeting of the church. You know, you get the kissy faces. I, I get some of those on my texts. Amanda says them to me. You know, it's the little brown guy with the little love kiss out in front of him. Yes, she loves me. <laughs> she ought to. But anyways... <laughs> I get those. But I'll tell you, this can't happen without a meeting of the church. Okay. Don't let, you're a teenager in here. You're a 20 something, a 30, a hundred and something. Don't let, don't buy the baloney that this meeting is not important, that this meeting is not for you. It is absolute baloney. We're going to move online, they say, and we're going to stay there. We think it'd be better. Better for what? Better to get where you want to go once all that's over with, finally? That's not the question we ask. We ask, what is biblical? What does God want? It trumps every time what I want. Or what you want. But we ask what God wants. What does he want? He wants people to pray for the pastor, their pastors, however it works out. He wants them to greet each other with a holy kiss. You know, a love as great as believers possess ought to be given out. Because we think, I'll tell you what, I just love everybody. Well, they love everybody that loves them. But let me tell you about the love that God has given to believers. It loves those that love them. They love those that love the Lord. But it's a supernatural love. It loves those that don't love them. You say, how do you know it's a supernatural love? Listen to Romans 5, 5. He says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. By the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Warren Wearsby said this, and I thought it's, it's appropriate. It's appropriate. He says, Warren Wearsby said, After the corporate worship is ended, the saints minister to one another. They greet one another and seek to encourage. He said, I have been in churches where the congregation escapes like rats leaving a sinking ship. Fellowship is a part of worship, and I think that's what Paul is really trying to get us at here. Fellowship is a part of it. Let's go to the third thing. Let's go to the third thing. Paul wanted the Thessalonians to promise, promise that others would hear the word of God. You're a teacher or a preacher. What is your commitment to that? 
Let me tell you what the commitment is in the church today, in pastor pulpits. Make it interesting. Do you have to make the word of God interesting to people who say they've been born again? Is not the word of God enough? You say, well, I've got to make it fun. I'll tell you, sometimes the things in the word of God aren't fun. There's nothing wrong with having fun. I like to have fun. But I'll tell you, this book needs to be taken serious. And we need to promise that we're going to get this word out so he can be heard. No matter how powerful you think your words are, the word of God is infinitely more powerful. That's right. And Paul is going to make this church pledge to him. Look, look at what verse 27 says. I charge you, he says. He's putting them under oath. He said, I charge you. Paul wanted them to be bound to the promise that all believers would hear this letter. He says, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. All the holy brethren. What does Paul have in mind here? Somebody said he envisioned reading in a public. His envisioned reading here is a public one where every believer would have a chance to hear this book of 1 Thessalonians read. Guess where that can't take place at either? Not away from the church. In this day, copies of 1 Thessalonians were yet to be made. We have thousands of them today in Coptic and Arabic and Latin and Greek. But when Paul wrote this letter, that was the only one they had. And he said, I want you to pledge to me, under pledge, I want you to pledge to me that they're going to hear this book be read. Somebody said there was only one treasured copy of the epistle, which made it impossible for everyone to read it individually. But Paul wanted to make sure, you know, that every believer heard that he had or that they heard what he had written by inspiration of God. Do you believe 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is given by inspiration of God? May we act like it. That we treat it as such. Not something we're, try, we're, we're trying to make interesting. Let me tell you what a pastor said. Goats don't like cheap food. You know what that means? Lost people don't really care about the word of God. That's right. But I'll tell you what, people that love the Lord, do you know what they want? The word of God. Right. They don't care if you have a great story to tell with. But they would love for somebody to open this book and say, here's what it says. And here's what it means. And to help them to do the same. It's not a fancy ministry. It's not a high-tech ministry. But I'm telling you, it's the ministry the church needs right now. Amen. Right now. He says, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. How was this done? It was done in the public meeting of the church. And this was done so that the truths contained in this letter that Paul had written could be heard, it could be received, and he could be acted upon. Because that is how the word of God is meant to be taken in. It's called milk, so the little one can take it in. It's called meat, so the mature can take it in. But either way, it's to be taken in and acted upon. Here's the last thing. We can wipe our brow and say this is the end of it. Verse 28. Paul wanted the Thessalonians to experience the grace of God. Do you know how many times I've read over this and just read it? I'm closing my Bible. But look at verse 28. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Why is grace so important? I want to read you what someone said, then I want to show you from Scripture why it's so important. Why is the grace of God so important? Think about grace. What is it? Somebody said it's God's riches at Christ's expense. It is really God giving us what we do not deserve. 
This hymn giving us, though, is some people will misuse that. It doesn't mean it's just given without a response. We believe the gospel. Therefore, we receive salvation by grace through faith. But that faith is the faith that responds to the gospel. But here's what somebody said. It says, the grace of God is the wellspring of all God's goodness to us. Forgiveness, salvation, peace, the gift of the Holy Spirit the maturing of our lives and holiness, the stirring of our hearts and will to follow him. All these are of grace. Remember I told you I had, a, I had a card that I would give families when I go to the hospitals or something. But it was 1 Corinthians 15. 10. This just came to me. And it says, Paul says to that church at Corinth, I am what I am by the grace of God. I need to know what that means as much as know what it says. I am what I am by the grace of God. I want to tell you about a man who went to Antioch, Barnabas. And I want you to hear what is said. You can write this in the margin of your Bible right there in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 28, but it's, it's the book of Acts, Acts 11, verses 21 through 23. Acts 11, and we're going to close after this, but I want you to hear what he says. People are getting saved in Antioch. I want you to hear they're getting saved. Lives are being changed. And I want you to hear how a little short expression says so much. But listen to what he says. It's being recounted in Acts 11, 21 through 23. And these people at Antioch are getting saved. And he says, and the hand of the Lord was with them, those at Antioch. And a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then the tidings of these things come unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas. He's going to go check it out. That he should go as far as Antioch. Verse 23 says, and who, when he came, listen to this line. And had seen the grace of God. Was glad and exhorted them all. That with purpose of heart they should cleave unto the Lord. It is by the grace of God. That we have all these blessings. That Antioch had it. That I had it. If the grace of God that works in the life of people. It is the grace of God that works in the life of people to bring about God's desires in their life. It is the grace of God in the life of people, working in the life of his people, that bring about God's desires in their lives. That's really what Paul was saying to them in 1 Thessalonians 5.28. He know they need. He knew they needed it. He says, "The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all," because they were going to need it to be what He had called them to be. They needed other things and had those things. We'll talk about that some other day, though. They needed grace. Alice is going to come and play for us. You say, Samson, I'm here, and I really don't understand how to be saved. Let me tell you this. I had the opportunity to share the gospel at a funeral that I preached this week. And I got to talk to a young man who wasn't sure about his salvation. And he had on a bread, he had on a brand new white shirt. And I said, did you know that God's character is like that shirt you have on? And I said, he's holy. There's no stains on it. He is absolutely holy. And the only ones who can fellowship with him and the only ones that can go into his heaven are the ones who are holy. But then I had on a black suit at that uh, funeral. And I said, this is what we look like. And I showed him that black suit coat. And I said, how are we going to fellowship with him and be ready to go in his heaven if we're black and he 
desires us to be as white as your shirt? He said, I, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure. Something like that, he said. He said, Jesus Christ sent his son. He sent his son to die in your place. He took your sin on himself. Every sin died on that cross for him. Satisfied the wrath of God concerning him. Put him as far as the east is from the west. He was buried. He arose again. Amen. And we trust him as our Savior. Yes. That's how we get that righteousness placed upon our account. It is a gift. I go from blackness to God's holiness. How? By trusting his son. Positionally, when God sees me, you know the old song, he sees the blood. Does he see my sins? No, he sees the righteousness of his son that's been placed on my account. How did I get it? I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Have you ever heard that message? Did you come in here thinking you were saved and you really weren't because you didn't know what the message was you believed to get saved? What ought, I, what ought you to do with it? Here's what you ought to do with it. Trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. I read John 3.36 at that funeral. It says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. That's what it says. God's promise. God's promise. Have you ever done that? Do it today. Church, you're here and you're saved. Don't be alone in the fellowship of believers. Don't be out and then not know who you are. That you even belong to the same church as them. Talk to them. Most of them won't bite you. Most of them. But let's pray. Pray for me. Pray for each other. Let's rely upon the grace of God for the days we're in to live how he'd have us to live. You stand with me.